This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey, everybody. This is Jill Whitlow. I play Cynthia in Night of the Creeps and Susan in Weird Science. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. You have a date, Tommy? Hey, dudes. Welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s-themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now, today, I am just so excited. I've been waiting a while for this interview. I will be talking to the legendary Stuart Fracken. Yes, Stuart Fracken, you know, from every teen sitcom, every, well, not every teen movie, but a lot of teen movies from the 80s. Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Teen Wolf 2, Valet Girls Under the Boardwalk. Uh, he was on uh, They Came From Outer Space with Dean Cameron. He was also in Ski School with Dean Cameron. The guy has just so many great credits, and we're going to talk about all of those today. I am so excited. I reached out to him about a year ago. He wanted things to um, calm down, you know, first with the pandemic going on and stuff, so I waited. And now I'm going to have him on today, and I am so excited. It's going to be awesome. So yeah, here is my interview with Stuart Fracken. This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Of course. My pleasure, my friend. (laughs) So going back in time, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Uh, yeah. (laughs) Uh, I think most people probably that do this have a proclivity to entertaining earlier on. Um, I did, you know, stuff for my family, you know, entertain for my family. And then when I got a little bit older, when I was in my early teens, started doing home movies, eight millimeter movies that, uh, eventually were cut together. They were always takeoff, takeoffs of movies that I watched when I was a kid. I'm a child of the uh, 70s and 80s, so right. we did uh, take off on uh, Jaws, 8mm uh, Jaws. Then it was 16mm. We added some, uh, yeah. uh, some sound to it at some point. Earthquake, $6 million man, you know, so... <laughs> There were always uh, some kind of uh, something going on at my house, so, yeah. Yeah, all the universal stuff that was just, you know, really popular in the 70s. Yeah, I I was always a huge fan. My brother also was a a big fan of movies, mostly movies, not necessarily TV at the time, but movies. My my brother introduced me to a lot of older movies, Mm -hmm. cool movies. Um, I could remember watching uh, James Cagney movies, The Strawberry Blonde, The yeah. Thin Man series. Um, so I, I eventually got into more comedies. Jerry Lewis was an influence, and then later, you know, Bill Murray, um, Michael Keaton in Night Shift. Those kind of movies yeah. were some of my early influences, and probably contributed to uh, eventually doing improvisation, which led to, of course, uh, helping in auditions. Yeah, those were all great. Yeah, I grew up on all the Saturday Night Live guys, too, and stuff. Uh, So, were you the class clown? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) It's hard (laughs) to admit, but yeah. I mean, it... uh, for, you know, for sure, I was the guy who um, would often prank other people, and uh, I, you know, I'm not sure if it was to seek attention or just try to make myself laugh. I sort of, I'm on the fence about that. You know, most class clowns or people that act out in school are looking for attention, but I think I was, I was more in it for myself. I wanted to entertain myself. Right. I was a, I was a shitty student. I didn't do well in school. I wasn't wasn't that into it until a little bit later when I realized I probably should um, pay a little bit more attention, high school and then a little bit of college. But yeah, I was always into 
you know, trying to make people laugh or, um, you know, I did a lot of theater uh, when I was younger, tried to pursue acting when I was um, much younger, when I was in my, when I was like uh, 10 or 11, tried to pursue acting, but my parents just didn't understand um, the passion for it. Yeah. And they didn't really believe in it, so, yeah. Yeah, they didn't want you to do the child actor thing then. Yeah, it was more of an inconvenience, I believe, yeah. to them. <laughs> it was more of a, you know, a, a pain in the ass to uh, take their their kid to auditions. And But I did get pictures taken, the classic, like, eight, eight and a half uh, by 11. Right. Uh, headshot with the, that you see from the, probably the, that time frame, the, uh, late 70s, early 80s, so there's one picture on the front, and then there's four in the back of you, like, doing weird stuff, like holding a telephone or a tennis racket. Oh, yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. That was that. That is somewhere in, uh, I have that somewhere, yeah. Yeah, the, the composite shots, did you get to do those? Yeah, that's yeah, exactly what I'm referring to. I have it in my head. Yeah. Thinking about what I looked like then, I was probably 12 or something. And uh, the front, the, the first picture was me holding a tennis racket. And then the back were, you know, four like wacky headshots, uh, you know, composites of um, one was holding like this old school camera. Um, and then the three others, I don't recall at the moment, but they were, you know, at the time, that's what you needed to submit to agents or uh, casting directors, but I didn't. I didn't pursue it that much at that time, uh, simply because I wasn't able to, because I, I wasn't supported enough. Um, it just wasn't something my parents understood or knew how to um, assist with. Yeah. Right. After high school, though, did you uh, study um, acting in college? Yeah, I went to I went to a two year college. I was, you know, it, it, if I'm peeling it back a little bit, like I said, um, you know, after I graduated from high school, I didn't have that much interest in going to college. Um, I was I was very focused on being an entertainer of some kind, uh, acting. I wanted to do plays. I wanted to do more theater. So I did go to college. Um, I also uh, participated in uh, uh, theater, local theaters, uh, what was called at the time non-equity plays. These were small uh, houses that uh, um, had a maximum of under 100 seats. That would be a non-equity right. uh, playhouse. In addition to, then I started taking classes. Then I was uh, also... In high school and in college, I competed in um, speech. So speech and debate. Um, I was recruited in high school because the speech and debate teacher knew I was a, an actor, so she uh, recruited me for speech. So they were competitions that you would travel all over the nation for, and I was, I was pretty good at it. Um, won a bunch of competitions, but it was always based around something to do with acting, but it was an interpretation. So the rules were you couldn't move, you couldn't uh, gesture, everything had to be localized to your face and facial expression. So it was more, it was called an interpretation. So you had like dramatic interpretation and humorous interpretation. And so we travel all over the nation. So that's what I did in college as well. And of course, repetition, right? Um, what do you mean? In, in acting class. Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, the, at the time, it was a little bit, it was harder to break into, uh, getting to, uh, to do theater and plays in college because you hadn't, you know, necessarily paid your dues, but then eventually I did, and I was able to do, uh, plays like Death of a Salesman, Truman Capote's The Grass Harp, uh, Children's Play, Alice in Wonderland, I played the Cheshire Cat. And, <laughs> and then eventually in college I met another actor who um, I became friends with. His name was Malcolm Daynar. I know, I know Malcolm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So Malcolm was a buddy of mine um, from school, and he was, at that time, you know, he was pursuing the dream. He was, uh, he got cast in Lords of Discipline. Right. And then he, uh, and then he went on to do Flashdance and Christine. And so anyway, so Can I was help us? with him, and he introduced me to uh, his agent, and that helped sort of open the door for me to um, slip in eventually. Um, but it was a, due to a lot of hard work, perseverance, and uh, brass balls to get to where I was at the time. <laughs> yeah, Malcolm's a great guy. Uh, did you did you study you studied improv at the Groundlings, right? Yeah, I took classes at the Groundlings, but I mostly honed my skills um, for improvisation um, in high school, and then uh, eventually I was in a. So I was introduced to improvisation in high school. So I had. I was heavily influenced by two teachers in high school the first two years when I was a freshman and a sophomore was a teacher that that was very focused on professional theater production. The next two years, she left. The next two years was completely the opposite. It was 180 degrees. The next, the next teacher focused only on improvisation. So that's what we did every single day. We did improv games. Um, every class, and then we had eventually had shows. And so I sort of learned all about um, the theory of improvisation through this teacher in high school, and then eventually I joined a class um, that was uh, was referred to by, I remember it maybe was one of the agents I met in uh, Hollywood. It was mm -hmm. called the ABC Comedy Workshop, and it was run by this guy who had a very uh, stellar reputation of finding talent. Mm -hmm. And it was held at the ABC studios in Hollywood. And oftentimes there would be people, industry people that would come and uh, watch the, the class because typically they would bring people in either casting or they would find uh, new talent that way. So. That's when sort of my career, you know, got a little bit of a lift was in that class. But yeah, eventually I did study at the Groundlings, got into I think the intermediate class, and then bounced after that. Yeah, uh, do you remember who was in the main company at the Groundlings when you were there? The teacher was so the teacher is this guy, incre very talented, incredibly talented guy. His name is Tim Bagley. Uh huh. He was one of my teachers. He's a character actor. If you look him up, you'll see he's got a wealth of talent uh, and a, a huge resume on IMDb. Mm -hmm. Vaguely was, um, uh, he was the teacher. He was also in part of the company too. Who are these, some of the others? I don't think they were. So I went to see a couple shows. I don't recall any of the uh, today. Mm -hmm. Tommy, I don't remember uh, if they went on to anything uh, of substance, but you know, of course, you know they have a a uh, long alumni history <clears throat> of some oh, yeah. very talented people graduated from the Growlings, obviously. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of them from the '70s. I've talked to some from the '80s. Yeah, a lot of talented people there. Uh, so, how did you get cast in Girls Just Want to Have Fun? Uh, I had a manager at the time, so that was definitely at the very beginning. I had a manager at the, so I did this, <laughs> I had this other class. It was a cold reading workshop. Uh, I have no idea how I got in. That was in Hollywood too, but I got into it and I met another actor there who I became very good friends with. Um, another uh, name that you may or may not know. He went by Wally Ward at the time. Yeah, it sounds familiar. He eventually changed. Yeah, he changed his name back to his mother's. I think it was his mother's maiden name, which was Langham. Oh yeah, Wally Langham. Wallace, yes. So Wally and I were in this class, and at the time I was so naive, Tommy. I had no idea where the showcase was being held. This was, I was, you know, 23 or something. Yeah. 
And then um, I eventually learned it was at the, it was called, I think, the Celebrity Center in the Scientology building in Hollywood. <laughs> That's where the showcase was being held. And then, of course, years later, I was like, oh, my God, what the hell was I doing there? The, the teacher was a Scientologist. Um, it's a completely different story. So Wally yeah. and I did this showcase there with a couple other young actors. And from there, we both got managers. Mm -hmm. um, he he was represented. You know, I don't know how much I I should I can say or or should say, but he was represented by one manager, and I was represented by another manager. They both both managers wanted us. So this one manager um, submitted me for a bunch of parts, and one of them was for a movie called Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Yep. So eventually, I I, I got an audition, and I went in for um, the one of the lead roles, who was the friend of the first male lead and uh it was pretty exciting so i did well I, i'm sure i improvised quite a bit and then they took me to the producers and then i heard from my manager that they really liked me they were considering me but they were going to make an offer to somebody from beverly hills high school and that was jonathan silverman <laughs> yeah so, uh, Jonathan accepted the role, and then my manager was like, is there anything else in there for Stuart to do? And they were like, what? what? They couldn't understand, like, why my manager was, like, taking me from the, you know, third banana to, like, a, you know, a small, the small, you know, three-line part. But the truth was I hadn't done anything, nothing up to that point. Right. So anyway, I got the part. Um, I'm sure I was terrible. And then um, the story behind that, there's a little, there's a story in that as well. The, one of the producers, so, so I'm on the set, I do the part, we film it, um, we wrap, I start walking to my car and my manager runs up to me and says, are you done? Are you finished? Right. And I was like, yeah. And she says, okay, everything's already done. They filmed you, you're on camera. And I said, yeah. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, they didn't know that you weren't in SAG. So there is a rule within SAG that if you are not in it, they have to do what was called, I don't know what it's called today, but it's called a Taft-Hartley, mm -hmm. which is a penalty. So they have to pay a penalty to get you into Screen Actors Guild. And there has to be a specific reason why. The specific reason has to be that this person, this actor, can only do this part because of this reason. Mm -hmm. because they want to cast people that are in the union. Anyway, so I kind of got my way into SAG. That was the reason. That's how I got into SAG. They didn't clear me until the day I was on the set when they realized I was not a member of SAG. So that's how I got into it. And then years later, one of the producers of Girls Just Want to Have Fun, his name was Chuck Russell, mm -hmm. who went on to direct uh, The Blob, the remake of The Blob. Nightmare on Elm Street uh, 3. For, Yep, it, it, not the Steve McQueen version. The I think. Um, yeah. Who was in the remake? It was. Uh, uh, Shawnee, Kevin Dillon. Shawnee Smith and Kevin Dillon. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so I went in for that role, and then according to Chuck, you know, the way he tells it is, I I snuck in to get my snag my SAG card, or that I was represented as having SAG. He said that when I went in for the audition. So, <laughs> not the truth. That's not how it happened. The way I just told the story is how it happened. But yeah, <laughs> sort of a brings it brought it full circle. I didn't get the role. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Alan, I didn't Al get the blob. Yeah, Alan Metter just uh, passed. What was he like as a director? Oh wow! I um, geez, Tommy, it was so long ago. I'll tell you what I I don't remember. Yeah. I was only on the set one day at a small part. Here's what I do remember. Mm -hmm. And I remember this because it had an, it had an impact on me um, for future jobs and how I act on the set. So the uh, lead actor, um, uh, who was Lee Montgomery, yes. was a child actor for many years. Right. Um, and I remember him from when he was a kid. He was the lead actor, so it was, uh, it was uh, Lee, 
uh, Jonathan Silverman, Helen Hunt, and Sarah Jessica Parker. So they were all the, the stars of that movie. So uh, I was, this was my first gig, first time on set, first time in front of a camera. Mm -hmm. And I kept messing up my lines. And so Lee, uh, for whatever reason, had a little bit of an attitude. So I didn't know what to do when you mess up your lines. You, try, you either continue or the director says cut. Right. So Lee sort of embarrassed me by continuing the scene even after I messed it up. And he, he turned to the director and he was like, oh, I, I thought I would just continue the scene instead of stopping again sort of calling me out. So I was pretty embarrassed by that. Learned a valuable lesson about set etiquette. And uh, hopefully that followed with me most of my career after that. <laughs> you then did a, um, a lot of guest starring roles on sitcoms, um, The Facts of Life. You were on that during the George Clooney era. Was that fun? It was great. Yeah, that was... Uh, that was, you know, when you look back uh, on um, those kind of experiences, those times way back when, you know, and you meet a guy like George. Um, mm -hmm. who, so when I met, when I did that show, it was my first sitcom. My first, yeah, it was the first sitcom I did. I didn't know anybody on the set. You know, when you do guest starring roles on established TV shows, you're sort of like an orphan. You're the guy who is, you're the guy, the girl who is, who is really just there temporarily, and then you move on to another show, and then hopefully, you know, you get your own show. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, I didn't know anybody on the set, and coincidentally enough, it was George's first day on the show as well. So he had just gotten cast. So um, we became very friendly. It was it, great working with him on the show. Total professional. And then I had run into George you know, a couple of times years later. We played uh, softball together. Uh, we knew some mutual friends. So whenever we ran into each other, it was always, you know, that bond you have with somebody, especially when you don't know anybody on the set, right? You know, right. You're, you're the new guy. And so obviously I think that he ended up being a recurring role for him on the uh, Facts of Life. And, of course, mine was just a quick guest star on it. But, that, yeah. That was a great. That was a great time, and certainly, um, you know, the story of working with George Clooney, you know, when he first started, or at the very beginning of his career, mm -hmm. doing kind of some stuff up to that point, uh, good for cocktail parties. Yeah, he had, he had a crew going at that time with like Grant Heslov and Richard Kind and a couple other people. Yeah. So Grant at the time, Grant was so there was a, uh, you know, there was a. Uh, team of actors um, that would all see each other on auditions because typically we'd go up for the same kind of roles. Right. Grant was one of those guys at the time. Grant was an actor. So Grant and I would go up against each other quite a few times. Uh, Dean Cameron was one of those other guys um, who is, we called ourselves the interview guys because that's what we were. We'd see each other in the room, be like, hey, dude, how you doing? What's up? What do you think about this? You know, what do you yeah. think about the script? It's good. I mean, we, there was not a, like a sense of competition between any of us. Yeah. Because uh, we were all different, and we all brought whatever we brought to the table, which was our own, um, you know, our, our own style, charisma, charm humor, whatever, but it was a, it was a bunch of guys that were very similar. We were always up for like the, you know, the, uh, the best friend to the lead, the wacky sidekick, that kind of thing. Yeah. And yeah, Grant was one of those guys. Yeah, he's, he, he's great. How, how was working on the, the Golden Girls? Yeah, the Golden Girls was, uh, was a thrill. So, um, you know, once again, you know, as a as as somebody who is first and foremost a fan of TV and film, it was you know an incredible thrill to work with um, those ladies and the director Terry Hughes. But you know, working with B. Arthur, 
Betty White, Rue McClanahan was just, uh, you know, incredible. I would sit there. So instead of, so while they rehearsed, I would sit in the audience stands and watch them and, you know, see what their, uh, their, uh, how they uh, worked with each other, how they responded to, um, you know, uh, mistakes, if they improvised, how they worked with the crew. So it was a, it was sort of a pivotal experience for me um, mm -hmm. because I was so young and green at the time that I had no idea, you know, no one, I didn't take a class in, um, you know, working in front of a camera, all my background yeah. was on the stage, was in theater and in improvisation. So it was, yeah, it was great working on that show. Um, except for Polly Holiday, who was Flo on Alice, guest starred on that show. Yeah. And um, we were backstage on the tape night which was, I think, usually Friday night. And we were both sitting next to each other. And uh, she was, she played one of the girl's sisters, I think, was blind. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're sitting next to each other. And I really am so excited. You know, I'm not really nervous. I, you know, I know my lines, we rehearsed it. I'm not at a point where I'm like, you know, nervous because I've been on stage for, you know, for many years. Right. So I'm like teeming with excitement and I'm sitting next to her and you could hear the audience and they're introducing the stars, you know, B. Arthur and there's a round of applause and Betty White, a round of applause. <laughs> and I turn to Polly and I go, isn't this exciting? And she looks at me with this stern look, this, this, nasty face and says shh I'm concentrating <laughs> she was getting into character of her blind sister and I was like holy shit what what did I just do and I was you know once again there's a another uh, another lesson for Stuart to learn on set etiquette about talking to people that are focused or you know very method when it comes to preparation. So, yep, another one of those, one of those stories you look back on and simply laugh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've heard some stories about her. I remember uh, when you were on Sledgehammer, you were eight track. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes. So uh, there was yeah, there was a time when I was doing a lot of guest starring roles. I was pretty lucky. Um, right around 86, something like that. Yeah, 86. I was doing a lot of uh, guest starring roles and Sledgehammer was one of those roles. I, I uh, broke out the New York punk dialect for that guy there for 8-track and uh, a lot of talented people on that show. Alan Spencer, who is oh, hysterical. A genius. Very funny. Total genius. <laughs> yeah. David Rache, of course, is the with Sledgehammer, has gone on to work for quite a few years in uh, character mm -hmm. roles. You would never have thought about it. Oh, yeah. Coming from that show, but clearly immensely talented. Um Another dude on that show too, I think, played the um, their boss. I think his name was Harrison Page. Yeah, Harrison Page. Oh my God, I can't believe I pulled that out. So I, <laughs> I worked with him years later on an episode of Tremors. Uh huh. So um, yeah, that was it. Was a lot of fun here. So I, I'm working on that show. It's on. <laughs> It's filmed, we filmed it at a school on La Cienega, La Cienega in Washington, not a great area. I've got a, my parents gave me a Camaro for my birthday when I turned, I think 16 or something. So I was still driving that car. So I parked it in a place I wasn't supposed to park it. It got broken into and my stereo was stolen when I was working on Sledgehammer. Oh, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> But a 
great time nonetheless, yeah. How was um, making uh, Valet Girls? Uh, Valet Girls mm -hmm. was uh, a lot of fun. Um, my first film role, I think, yeah, I think that was my first film role. That was uh, from a company called Empire, um, who did a lot of low-budget films when they were doing those kind of low-budget films and they still had a release, you could still release them. Mm -hmm. um, once again, I probably got that role by improvising quite a bit um, on that. It was a lot of fun, a lot of impro uh, improvisation that met some nice people. Uh, Aaron Marshall, I'm still, still in touch with. Uh, Mary D. Marshall, she went by. Yeah, I, um, I talked to Bridget Sienna. Who was that? She played Yolanda. She was the uh, the, the the Latino chick. I don't remember. It's been so long since I've seen the movie, Tom. I have like just <laughs> faint recollection. Then of course I have a a story behind that movie. So that was at the time I was a major partier. Um, yeah. There wasn't anything I would I would turn down. So, once again, a a, a lesson I learned about working. So we were doing an all night shoot. Uh, uh, we shot a lot of evenings for that movie in a house in the hills, some mansion in the hills they rented, and so mm -hmm. you know, sitting around all night, you know, midnight, one o'clock, you know, in the morning, two o'clock, I'm up all night. One of the crew guys was like, "Hey man, you want to? You think you're going to work?" And I was like, "I don't know. I don't. I don't think so. It was fine. And you know, I'm you know in my twenties, hanging out, having a good time on the set. He was like, "You want to? You want to get stoned?" And I'm like, <laughs> "I don't know if I could. You know, I guess." So we just go into his truck <laughs> <laughs> and we spark up a joint and we start getting stoned. I'm seeing you know, it was one of the crew guys, probably a teamster. <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, you know, that time it wasn't nearly as potent as it is today. But I'm definitely stoned. And we get a knock at the window. It's one of the ads, and he goes, "Stuart, we need you on the set right now." <laughs> so I run to the set, and thankfully, it's just some um, reaction shots. It's toward the end of the movie. I have a vague recollection of the scene, Tommy. But if you watch it today, it's it's hysterical with keeping this in mind. I was completely stoned. They they uh, shot it in one shot, and that take is in that final cut of that movie. And it's only funny because I, I they were, so John Terleski, I think, is a, he plays the boyfriend of one of the ballet girls, and who, who knows, who cares about the plot at this point? Um, so he has a shotgun, and he pretends to shoot it. So he responds to, and they're going to add in a shotgun uh, later in post. So the director, Rafal Zelensky, goes bang or something like that. And so I anticipate it prior to him saying it. So in the final cut, you can see me responding to him saying bang right before he says it. So mm -hmm. that's... That's what happens when you get stoned on the set. Yeah. Your uh, response times uh, tend to go out the window. So another valuable lesson I learned. So in the final cut of Ballet Girls, you could see Stuart Bradkin responding to an off-camera bang before it happened. And then the others two respond perfectly. So uh, that's a quick Ballet Girls story. And <laughs> so at the end of the movie... Um, there is uh, a scene on the Hollywood sign. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. Yes. Um, but at the end of the at the end of the the movie, there is a scene where there's some bet, and the ballet girls make the ballet boys go onto the Hollywood sign and strip yeah. down naked. Yeah. <laughs> so they so they have two shots, Tommy. There's a shot in a helicopter, and then there's a close up. So I'm like freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, my parents are gonna see this. My family's gonna see this. You know, eventually my kids are gonna see this. I'm thinking, I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna do this. I don't wanna do this. So we eventually shoot it. We're on the first O in Hollywood. 
And then finally, I see the final cut, and I learn that the close-up of all of us got ruined. So they couldn't use that shot. They could only use the helicopter shot some, from far away. So I was spared the expense of seeing my bare ass on celluloid for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. LA girl. Yeah. So I so I know that um when um you uh got the role of Styles in Teen Wolf 2, you hadn't seen the first one. I, I personally think that Jerry Levine stole the first movie. He was so great as Styles. But when you got the, the role um for two, did you feel any pressure that you had to, you know, fill his shoes and live up to it? None. None. Zero. I hadn't seen it. Um, so in my mind, when I read the script, mm -hmm. I got the feeling of how I was going to interpret Styles. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure it would have made much of a difference anyway. At the time, Tommy, I was doing my own thing. Mm -hmm. I was really my own character, you know, but when I eventually did see it, I agree with you. He was great. Yeah. Uh, Jerry did a great job. He was very funny. Um, he was original. Um, he definitely originated the part of Styles. My version of Styles is my version of Styles. Right. Um, I I didn't feel any pressure at all at the time. You're talking about a you know a. How old was I? Like twenty four or something? Twenty four year old kid. Yeah. Starting. I just went in, did my shtick. They liked it, and then uh, it wasn't until I got the part that I watched the first uh, Teen Wolf. Um, did I change anything when we eventually filmed? Not at all. I did not not change anything. Mm -hmm. And so, if you know anything about uh, Teen Wolf two or you have watched any of the, um, there is a Blu-ray version of it, mm -hmm. an anniversary edition, and they uh, interviewed some of the cast. So I tell a story in that mm -hmm. of, um, my understanding is the, in my mind, the two characters are possibly related, but their first names are different. Ah. Uh. So the so that's how I justify it, Tommy, as well. And I'll continue to justify it because I have proof. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Jerry's character was Rupert. Yeah. My character was Ridley. So, and in, in the Blu-ray version of uh, Team Wolf 2, and they interview, uh, you know, they did the same thing for the anniversary version of Team Wolf, I actually share a nameplate that I took from the set that has his name on it, Ridley Stilinski. So that's sort of how I justify it. So I know there's a there is some debate, you know, of uh, you know the two characters. But for me, I just did my own thing. Um, I improvised a lot in that movie. Yeah. Um, a lot of a lot of stuff was cut from that movie, so they made it more of a romantic comedy between uh, Jason's character and Esty's character. But um, yeah, you know, to answer your question, no, I didn't feel any pressure. Uh, that's good. Yeah, I know that the first Teen Wolf they had some stuff that was cut out, and it showed up in the TV version. Um, I guess I guess nothing um, showed up in the TV version for Teen Wolf Two. But yeah, that often happens. Uh, stuff gets cut out, and uh, the movie turns out uh, terrible. Um, but was uh, was Jason Bateman uh, and everybody good to work with? Right. Yeah, it was a great experience. It was. Uh, yeah, I was in. You know, I was in movie heaven for a while there. I mean, it was uh, it was filmed um, in Claremont, California which is about uh, an hour and a half, two hours from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So we all stayed together. It was probably three and a half weeks, three and a half weeks to a month. It was a lot of fun. We did some rehearsal. Um, but it was, a, it was a total great experience. And Jason was a, 
you know, I don't know what he's like today because I'm not in contact with him, but he was a good guy. He was a good dude, very talented, clearly a star. Um, mm -hmm. Even then, I could tell that he knew he was a professional. He was funny. He was a good actor. He was a, he was a good guy. Yeah, we all had a good time. Cast was, was pretty close at the time. Mark, Mark Holton, S.D. Chandler, Jason, me. Mark. Um, and the other... Uh, yeah, Mark. I said Mark Holton. Oh yeah. Um, and then uh, the other, the other uh, characters as well. Uh, Rachel Sharp, who goes by Minnie, Minnie Sharp. Um, mm -hmm. Robert Neary, as well. It was a great. It was a, It was fun. You know, the finished product didn't turn out like I thought it was going to turn out, or maybe it did. I don't know. It for me. I think they had an opportunity to do something different, better, original than the first one, but it didn't end up that way. But a lot of, a lot, a lot of people love that movie, still have a lot of fans yep. contacting me for that movie. Uh, I just watched it the other day. I watched a couple of scenes from it. It was on one of the cable channels, so I watched a couple of scenes from it. It just reminds me of... Uh, working in Claremont and meeting uh, Jim Hampton was a total thrill. Yeah. Uh, the late Jim Hampton, who unfortunately was suffering from, I believe, Alzheimer's and dementia for several years. Yeah. Great guy, classic character actor. Um, when I first met him, this is, goes back to uh, earlier when I told you about my brother introducing me to a lot of older movies, and even though at the time it wasn't that old, uh, but he introduced me to the first Longest Yard yeah. with uh, Burt Reynolds, um, and Jim Hampton was in it, and he forever will be tied to that movie for me. I know he was also in F Troop. That's what it was. He was on Death Troop. Yeah, he was in The Longest Yard. He was a lot. He was a lot of good stuff. I mean, he was just, you know, a professional character actor, and he had that down home Oklahoma accent. I mean, he was just he yeah. was a dynamic actor. You know what though? What what stood out to me is he was just a professional. He was just he was one of those guys who who, you know, you meet, you're enamored with. But then you, you meet them, and they're salt of the earth. Just a good dude. So you know he's that that personality, that easygoing personality. That's exactly the way he was for me. Once again, you know, a young actor, inexperienced, not sure how to uh, behave on a set. He definitely was a shining example of that. So may he rest in peace. Yeah, I talked to Jim McCrell, who played the asshole principal in the first Teen Wolf. He told me him and James yeah. Hampton, they knew each other about 20 years before um, they, they, they worked together on that movie. He said they were, just, they were just cracking up, you know, during that scene where, you know, he pees his pants <laughs> after he scares him. Um, yeah. After he growls. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm a huge fan of Under the Boardwalk. I think it's such an underrated movie. I've talked to Fritch Karras, the director. Uh, does anything stand out from that one? Oh, man. Absolutely, dude. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing you get for me is, uh, I mean, I have a, for these kind of things, I have a steel memory. Mm -hmm. and so, you know, Under the Boardwalk was, it's funny because I work with a guy, and I I hadn't heard the those three words together unless I was listening to some classic rock station. So this guy was like, we were talking. Oh, he oh I, we quoted I quoted something. I said good from far and far from good, and he was like, dude, that's from like one of my favorite movies, and I was like, what what movie is that? He was like, it's called Under the Boardwalk. I was like, bro, I was in that movie. He was like, no, you weren't. I mean, of course, it was, you know, 30, 30 years ago. He was like, no, you weren't. I was like, yeah, it was laps. So, of course, it freaked him out. He went, went home and watched it again. So, Under the Boardwalk, originally called Wipeout. And Fritz Kirsch was not the first director of that movie. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, he so, told me that. Uh, 
Did he say that? Yeah. Yeah, so that movie was um, originally called Wipeout. And uh, once again, a call back to uh, an earlier part of our interview here. My buddy was cast in that movie too, Wally. Mm -hmm. Wally Ward was in that. Um, and so they they filled the cast out. You had the Vals and the Lokes. And then yeah. you had the two leads um, played eventually by um, Danielle Von Zernick and Richard Joseph Paul. Mm -hmm. Those two parts were recast. So those two leads, and I'll, I don't think I should mention their names, but <laughs> um, they, the, the guy who played, uh, I don't remember the character, oh, Nick? Is that him? Yeah, I Nick. think so, yeah. Or is that, that might be the other guy's name, I don't remember the character's name, but the guy who played it was a really nice guy. Yeah. Really good dude. Uh, and then we get a phone call. <laughs> we're down for a couple of weeks, guys. So we were always at the beach. So what we did every single day, take surf lessons and hang out at the beach. Me, Brett Marks, who was in it, who was one of the uh, Vals. Bad News Bears. Wally. Yeah, exactly. That. Yep. Yeah. We were buddies for quite a few years after that, being uh, Marksy was his nickname um, and so we just hung out at the beach Tommy we just did our thing uh, uh, waited for them to recast it and then they recast it and up we went and ha had a new director <laughs> original director I think his name was Ian Seberg uh -huh. nice guy um, I don't know why it was recast my guess is they're the, the two lead characters have uh, any chemistry um, but both of them were nice people anyway up and at them we get going oh, we really liked it it was a great it was a lot of fun shot in Seal Beach a lot of it was shot in Seal Beach yeah uh, it was a big big fat party I mean you know you get a bunch of you know mid 20 actors together they're gonna party is what we did <laughs> um, great experience Sad it didn't have the kind of opening or recognition at the time. Kind of got buried. Um, you know, at the time, you know, independent films released by these small companies like New World, uh, Atlantic, who released um, the Teen Wolf movies, um, tried to break into the studio system. It was increasingly difficult for them which, you know, changed quite a bit. And at that time, they were sort of that transition. So potentially the movie like that, which is a fun little movie, got lost. And so it had a very small opening, but um, obviously lives, it's, uh, lives uh, has, a, has a second, third life. Because like I said, I was shocked when somebody brought it, brought it up that they not only seen it, but it's like one of their favorite movies. Oh, yeah. So I'm glad that, yeah. Yeah, that's a great. You liked it. What what stands out for you in that movie? It has a real it has a real West Side Story quality to it, you know, of sure. you know um, gangs versus gangs, and then trying to get the girl and all of that stuff, you know, just without the musical stuff, of course. Right, right. And yeah, for sure, that's a, exactly what it was modeled after. Yeah, and I think Keith Coogan does a good job. Of uh, playing, playing, you know, how old, however old he was at that time, and then playing older when he's telling the story, you know. Right. I, I like all right. of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Then you did a movie written by a friend of mine, Ken Hall. It was Doctor Alien. Oh sure. <laughs> he's a good guy. Yeah. And Ken, Ken he's a good dude. Uh, so that was. Um, you know, once again, a lot of these things, a lot of the stories I tell, they have, they're sort of related to each other. So uh, that movie, so I was sort of in the stable of actors who worked at Empire Films. Once again, independent, small label, a small company. Mm -hmm. But that one, so Empire was run by Charlie Band. Right. 
um, who then eventually um, spun off into doing um, full moon features full movies. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So I did. I did uh, a few films for Charlie for his kids label. He had. He, it was called Moonbeam. Yeah. So I did a couple movies for him. One called uh, Prehysteria. Yep. And then um, they brought me back. Uh, and another actor, Tony Longo, to reprise our characters in another movie called Revote. Really cute movies. So, yep. Dr. Alien, which was the first title, which I really liked. So, they, they loved having these, these, uh, these old sci-fi callback to the 50s movie names. So, they did a movie, Tommy, called Test Tube Team in the year 2000. And yeah. I totally <laughs> love that title. And I begged to be in that movie. So I didn't get in that movie, but then they were casting a movie called I Was a Teenage Sex Mutant. <laughs> yeah. So that is the original title for Dr. Alien. So they shot that movie during the... Um, writer's strike so i can say this you know this many years later but there was a writer's strike tommy so i had to work most of the actors had to work uh had to break the line to be able to do that there was uh you know not it wasn't sag who was striking it was the writers so i did that movie then a lot of fun um hey just just so you uh, just so you're aware my mm. earpods here are giving me a signal, so I don't know how much time I have. Yeah. Um, so if they do wear down, can I call back? You want me to call back? Of course, of course. Okay. So, um, yeah, so I was a teenage sex mutant, a lot of fun, very low budget, massive amount of improvisation, a little weird, strange experiences, you know, <laughs> on set with uh, Lene Quigley was in it. Yeah, I've talked to Linnea several times. She's a character. Yeah, she was in it, and then uh, I think I had a scene with her at the end where the, my character becomes a successful entrepreneur, producer, something to that effect, yeah. I was working with uh, Olivia Barish. I I've talked to her, too. Great. Yeah. yeah. Good, good people, Billy, Jacoby, good dude. He's a funny guy. Um, the, uh, the director, the, uh, uh, David Dakota. Uh, oh, yeah, David Dakota, yeah. yeah. Good, good guy. A lot of fun. Very low budget, Tommy. You know, it wasn't like the normal, the normal stuff that I had been doing, but then again... They were filming it on a very small budget. Like I said, during the writer's stroke, they pulled it off. And um, didn't get paid a lot. Um, end product, a lot of, you know, very campy. Yeah. Obviously, uh, having Troy Donahue in it, they clearly were trying to make a point. Having the name, I sort of like the name, but I wish they would have stuck with I Was a Teenage Sex Mute. I think that says a lot, just the title itself. Yeah. Uh, I think it's put better than Dr. Ailey, in my, my opinion. And, yeah, Ken Hall's a good guy. Very good guy. Uh, Freddy's Nightmares, The Art of Death, you guest starred on with um, Ken Wiederhorn directing. What do you remember from that? I, You know, I had a couple of years where I was growing, you know, maturing, trying to get out of playing, um, you know, wacky, offbeat, roles. I was still like the best friend in that. My hair was considerably longer. So that was around the same time, Tommy. It was around that same time when I did mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Alien. Um, what else did I do around that time? I'm Dangerous Tonight with Toby Hooper, the movie The Week. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I sort of was, was trying to transition away from, you know, the high school roles you know, trying to mature in Hollywood, and so that was one of those roles I took um, on Freddy's Nightmares. Uh, you know, you can, once again, 
if you watch it, you can see I'm, I look a little bit older. My hair is much longer. I'm starting to, you know, grow up. Um, so that was sort of that transition period. Um, one of the, the, the guy who played the lead character in that, it was like actually a good little show. That episode was the, I think it was Carrie Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're still in touch. Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. How does uh, Ski School come to you? Uh, so Ski School uh, came to me in um, somewhere around uh, early 89. Uh, once again, you know, I sort of trying to break away from trying to create my own brand for myself, yeah. um, picking different roles, trying to um, take advantage of um, the stuff that Don Beans Baxter and um, Team Wolf 2 and Under the Boardwalk, and then I get the script for Ski School. And I, the main character is the character I wanted to play. And his, the character's name is Dave Marshall at the time. At the time. So um, uh, I auditioned for that role, and uh, they put me on tape, and then um, they come back to me. It sounds familiar, and they come back to me, and they say, we're making an offer to someone else, would you consider a different role? And I said, no. I said, this is the character that I should play, Dave Marshall, and that's the character I want. So the answer is no. So they make an offer. They cast Dean Cameron as Dave Marshall, who eventually they changed to Jade, Dave Marshak. And then they come back to me and they say, there's this other character you could have creative input. You can sit down with the writers. You can have, um, uh, you can improvise. We'll make him a main character. And uh, and so that's so they made me an offer. So I thought about it. I thought about the fact that I could work in uh, Canada and Whistler, British Columbia. But to be honest with you, the deciding factor was I got to work with Dean. Yeah. And, uh, up to that point, you know, I knew about Dean. Um, clearly, I was familiar with his work. We had run into each other a lot over the years. Yeah. He was one of the interview guys, immensely talented. So the main reason why I took ski school was to meet Dean and work with Dean. I know every time I reach out to him, he's always replying to me with sarcasm. <laughs> he's a funny yeah. guy. That's my buddy. Yep. Yep, he is. He's funny. He is funny, immensely talented. I, I wish he, um, he should be directing mm -hmm. more. He should, uh, uh, people should hire him um, to do anything other than what he's done thus far. I think that will happen. He's one of those guys who is in it for the long haul. Just a talent, overly talented guy. Yeah, very. And it was... Yeah, great experience. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that that's what you get when you reach out to him because that's just his personality. He's yeah. just a, he's very witty, funny, charming, but definitely sarcastic. I mean, that's probably why we got along so well. Yeah, the uh, Darlene was in it. Darlene Vogel. How was she to work with? Yeah, fabulous. The whole thing was just great, Tommy. It was it was one of those experiences. You know, like I said, I was growing. You know. You know, getting some experience under my belt. So uh, the script wasn't fully fleshed out. So uh, writers, the writers came to us and asked us to uh, contribute more because they could see that Dean and I, and to a certain extent Pat Laberto, yeah. were sort of jumping in and owning the scenes we were in. You know, and sort of um, changing the trajectory of the movie. Uh, into that that real Animal House feel, so they came to us and asked us to write a bunch of scenes. Um, we did. We gave it to them. It was typed up, and they were in the script the next day. We shot them to for, sort of fill in the gaps, and um, and time wise too. Cast was great. Darlene Vogel, I eventually worked with again on a couple of series of commercials with John Landis. 
Yeah. Um, I, I know that some of the Canadian cast has worked. Spencer Roquefort or Rockford. He worked quite a bit um, after that. Um, and of course, you got Pat. Uh, you know, the other folks, I don't know about the director, Damian Lee, I'm not sure what happened to him. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was so much fun. Such a great time working in. We got to work in uh, Whistler, British Columbia. Um, and like I said, the, the best part about that experience was working with Dean. Yeah, and then you guys did, they came from outer space, and everybody I've talked to who guest starred on there, and even Tommy McLaughlin, they, they tell me just how funny you two were on that show, and just how you were always cracking people up. Yeah, Dean and I um, had something pretty special for a short period of time there. We, um, you know, we... we just were on the same wavelength. We, as, De- as Dean put it, we had lightning in a bottle. Just just our, our comedic timing, um, our improv skills, I mean, that's how we got the, that's how we got it. We got the show together because of that. Just all, just all came together. It's too bad that it couldn't continue or evolve into something else. But yeah, that was another incredible experience working six months with Dean every day on a TV show that was ours <clears throat> that we got to improvise on and put on the script. Um, you know, we didn't get into like casting and so forth, but you know, I worked with a lot of people, a lot of friends I knew over the years. Right. Um, great fun. And then uh, eventually they tried to sell the show as a block with the other shows that they had on at the same time that they all produced together. They were trying to create another network called the Hollywood Premier Network and it didn't quite work out. I think the other two shows were a show called um, Shades of Grey. Mm-hmm. No, Sh- Shades of L.A., excuse me. Shades of L.A. And, and She Wolf yeah. of London. I think that's what that was called. So there were three shows they produced at the same time. Ours was one of them, and yeah. Yeah, Tommy was great. Um, you know, Dean and I went in together. Our plan was always from the very beginning, when we first, we both got scripts, and we were both going to potentially go in for the same character. I think we were both going to go in for Abe. And then Dean and I were like, why don't we go in together? You go in as Bo and I'll go in as Abe. So we went to his house, we practiced the fight together, and we basically walked in and we're like, okay, listen, you know, these aren't the sides that you know you pick, but we're gonna, we wanted to do this together. We think there is something here that you should see. So um, we did, we went in and I think it took like four times and we went to the network several times and then eventually they, they sort of, they sort of had to do it by then. <laughs> they, they had no choice at that time they tried to pair Dean up with somebody else I mean even though I'm telling that story I, I remember who the actor was and I was like there's no no way there's no way that person is going to work with me no way so that didn't work out so eventually they, they cast this book yes the outtakes Tommy were pretty damn good <laughs> I bet. Yeah, <clears throat> a couple of my friends who um, guest starred on there were like Tuesday Night and Brooke Thies from Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Brooke, I did... Uh, who is it? No, no, it wasn't Brooke, yeah. So she guest starred on that, and then we have like some comments. You can know some people. We have a comment, so yeah. Brooke was on the school episode... That yeah. they, school fools, it's called. Yeah. Uh, and then, um, I don't know why I thought about that, but Heather Lagenkamp, who is in um, Nightmare, I did a commercial with her. Yeah. Wendy's commercial with her years ago. And then, um, oh, Tuesday. Wonderful. Awesome. Yeah. She was in the pilot. It was great. Yeah, I love her. Uh, yeah, uh, Joanne Deering played the teacher in that school episode. I brought it up to her about. Oh, yeah. I brought it up to her a month ago. She don't remember a thing about it. <laughs> really? 
Yeah. Huh. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, I remember her, and she was that. It was the same episode, right? That was that was that same school episode. Yeah. Right, the episode that Brooke was in. Yeah. Yeah, she yeah. don't remember a thing about it. <laughs> That's funny. Who else did you? Did, was it just those two? Uh, I'm sure there's somebody else here and there. I can't remember. I've, I've interviewed so many people now that I can't even get it all straight. Yeah. But certain ones stand out, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So to uh, kind of wrap this up, uh, I was curious to know. Did, so did you leave acting, or are you still in it? Yeah. So um, did I leave acting? I guess I, you know, as far as the, the public is concerned, I did, you know, for, um, you know, at some point, you know, you, you start working in your early 20s, and then, uh, you know, I always say how lucky I was to work consistently as I did and make a living for about 15 years, um, but eventually I got married. I had kids, I bought a house, and, um, you know, guest starring roles and residuals just wasn't cutting it. So, you know, I had to make some changes. And so, um, you know, after, you know, I, I've done some guest starring roles, Malcolm in the Middle and Tremors, and so I sort of took a little bit of a turn. <clears throat> but I always thought to myself that when my kids get a little bit older, I'm going to start pursuing it again. So my kids are a little bit older, so I am going to do. So I started, I got new headshots. I'm going to redo my website, and um, on, I'm on Cameo now. So mm -hmm. yeah, slowly but surely, you know, the one thing about showbiz is it doesn't have a limitation. You can get into it whenever you want, as long as there's something that you offer, you know, to sort of, to uh, come full circle to my uh, SAG story earlier on. Yeah. Girls just want to have fun. As long as you have something that you can add that someone else doesn't have, there's a place for you in the community. So, you know, you'll, you will definitely see me again somewhere soon. Um, might awesome. take a little time, but yeah. I mean, that's, that's the story behind, you know, where I went. Do you, uh, do, do you ever do the autograph shows? You know what, it wasn't really, it's not really my thing. Um, I was asked to do them a few years back. Um, Dean asked me to do one with him. Mm -hmm. And then he kind of got soured on them. He had a poor experience, so he was like, I'm yeah. not going to do it. I'm not going to do it anymore. So um, the answer to that is no. I've, I've done um, uh, reunion panels before. Yeah. But no autograph shows, no. Yeah, well, you've had a great run. I think um, that uh, you'll definitely um, get more acting jobs in the future. But uh, you left L.A., right? No, I live in I live in L.A. still. Oh, okay. I'm not sure where that came from? Yeah, yeah. I live in L.A. I live I've lived here all my life. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. It's where my home is. It's where I live now. I'm so in and around Los Angeles, but at some point, my wife and I probably will will move some point yeah but yeah i'm still here has uh has uh, covid uh, been an okay experience for you i guess as as good as it can be tommy you know thankfully i um i have not gotten it i did not get it um i wasn't overly cautious but i certainly was more careful um than uh than i i have been um but uh you know, thankfully, no one in my my mother got COVID. She was she was fine. Uh, but thankfully, I was I have I was not affected by it personally, which is good. That is very good. Yeah, we have a very low death rate over here in Reading. It's like seventy or something. Oh yeah. my God, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's bad for the families, but it's fantastic overall in terms of it spreading. You know. Well, Stuart, I thank you so much for coming on today. This has been a lot of fun, and I'm glad uh, you're you're remaining positive. You know, so many actors I talk to, you know, are so are so bitter, but you have a, a good head on your shoulders. Well, listen, it's a difficult business. Um, like I said, 
I've been lucky. Um, you know, a lot of it was uh, being at the right place at the right time, not caring. I mean, that's the that is the secret to auditioning. You have to have a certain degree of whatever happens and not caring, and I'm going to do the best I can. And so I, you know, instill the same thing with my kids and. I had a great time, a good experience with uh, the people that I've talked to you about. You know, I'm still very good friends with Dean. Yeah. I'm in touch with a lot of other people over the years. No reason to be bitter, for me at least. I mean, yeah, certainly there have been some experiences we, should, we can talk about another time. <laughs> uh, but for me, they're all great stories. They're all learning experiences. So I, I, I appreciate you asking me on, Tommy. I hope your audience has enjoyed this and certainly they can contact me anytime they want on on any social media and uh, as i mentioned a little earlier i'm not go very affordable because thankfully i don't need the money so i just do it for fun yeah i've uh, incredibly enjoyed this you have yourself a great day and stay safe yeah you too tommy take care talk to you soon take care bye-bye well, there you have it. <clears throat> Stuart Fracken. Ain't he a cool dude? What a nice guy, huh? I'm glad that we got to have this talk today. And glad he still remained positive, like I said. It was a great experience. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>